Good morning, everyone. My name is Tammy Yi, and I am a CST account manager for many institutions in the Midwest. Welcome to today's CST Learning Lab Live session. I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Virginia Bain, who is one of our scientists here at CST that validates reagents for use in your immunofluorescence experiments. Today, we're going to discuss four four considerations for multi-channel imaging experiments. During both live sessions, you'll also have the opportunity to ask questions by typing them into your GoToWebinar questions area in your control panel. For those of you just signing in, welcome to the CST's Learning Lab Live session. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our IF expert, Virginia Bain. Thank you for joining me. Today I will be sharing some considerations with you about fluorophores that I hope will be useful in your experimental design process. So first, let's discuss how it is that we get fluorescence. Here on the right, I'm showing you a common molecule used in fluorescence microscopy, FITSI. On the left, I'm showing you the histogram of FITSI's excitation. What this means is that when the light of a certain wavelength encounters FITSI, it will excite the fluorophore to a certain degree based on wavelength. The optimal excitation for FITSI is between 480 and 520 nanometers. And so, when we shine a laser of a 488 line on FITSI, the electrons in the fluorophores are excited, but they're in an unstable state. And so, some energy is lost through heat or other processes, before the electrons return to their ground state. As such, lower energy is released, but at a higher wavelength of light. And we call this a Stokes shift. Another consideration when thinking about fluorophores is how bright they are. The first thing that impacts fluorophore brightness is how many fluorophores you are working with. When working with fluorophores conjugated to an antibody, it is possible to have different numbers of fluorophores attached to the antibody. Now, obviously, more is brighter. But with that being said, there's a point where too many fluorophores could change the behavior of the antibody or cause self-quenching. So it's important to find the point where there are some fluorophores conjugated, but that the antibody still performs as is expected. Another factor that impacts fluorophore brightness is quantum yield. This is a ratio that looks at how many photons are absorbed by the fluorophore and how many photons the fluorophore is able to emit. You can see here that alexafluor 488 has a much higher quantum yield than alexafluor 647. The other thing that impacts fluorophore brightness is the extinction coefficient. What I mean by this is the capacity that the dye has for absorbing light. This can be calculated using the Beer-Lambert law by examining fluorophore absorbance at various concentrations. Quantum yield and extinction coefficient together determine how bright a fluorophore will be. So now let's talk about how fluorophores work in an immunofluorescence experiment. At the bottom left, I have a 3D model of PD-1. Let's imagine that this is being expressed in a mouse lymph node. I can use an antibody to detect this protein. In this case, I'm using a rabbit anti-PD-1 antibody. However, without additional steps, I have no way of visualizing where the antibody is located. So I'll use an anti-rabbit secondary, which is conjugated to fluorophores, in this case, alexafluor 488. So when I expose the fluorophores to light of the appropriate wavelength, using some sort of charge coupled device to capture the image, I'm able to detect the light that is emitted from my antibody in my sample. The image I'm showing you here has been pseudocolored green. However, the camera or photomultiplier tubes, because this is a confocal image, was originally captured in grayscale. By capturing a number of these grayscale channels, I'm able to make a composite image where I've overlaid the channels that I imaged. So what type of samples can you use for immunofluorescence? Honestly, the sky is the limit. A lot of the validation work that we do at CST uses cultured cell lines. We like to work with this sample type because the cells grow quickly and are easily manipulated. With that being said, we expect our antibodies to perform equivalently in tissue that has been processed in a similar manner to how our cells are processed. You can perform immunofluorescence in most organisms, although there are some challenges associated with certain model systems. For instance, plants and insects can be challenging due to their existing fluorescent properties, 
special considerations may be necessary if you're working in a system that already has fluorescent proteins. You will want to consider what spectra are already in use from the fluorescent proteins to avoid spectral overlap. Typically, fluorescent proteins are sensitive to organic solvents like ethanol or xylene, and so certain processing may be difficult. You could get around this problem by using an antibody against the fluorescent protein if you must use organic solvents. Finally, some fluorescent proteins like cyan fluorescent protein are particularly sensitive to photobleaching, and so you may want to set up image acquisition in a different channel and be very conservative with how much you excite the CFP to preserve sample intensity. When performing an immunofluorescence experiment, there are several types of secondaries to choose from. Here, I'm showing whole molecule secondaries. In this case, antibodies were collected from sera of one species inoculated with protein from the species that you're trying to detect. These antibodies are purified and conjugated to your fluorophore of interest. Whole molecule secondaries contain an FC domain, which binds to cells with FC receptors. And so using this type of secondary may cause some background. You can work around this by using FAB2 or FAB fragments, which are digested by pepsin and papain, respectively, to digest or remove the FC domain. Fragments are also better able to penetrate tissue compared to whole molecule secondary. Because extra processing is performed, these types of secondaries are more expensive than whole molecule secondary. Regardless of the secondary type that you choose, the most important consideration for a secondary is to use a highly subtracted secondary. As I mentioned before, secondaries come from purified sera and are generally polyclonal in nature. There may be some antibodies in this mixture that bind non-specifically and give background. By performing cross-absorption, the background producing antibodies can be removed and this greatly increases the performance of your secondary. There are a number of different detection methods you can use for an immunofluorescence experiment, and these will impact the intensity of your signal. When working with fluorophore conjugated primary antibodies, we refer to this as direct detection. This is because the antibody that detects your protein of interest is directly conjugated to fluorophore. Because the fluorophores are on the primary antibody, the number of fluorophores that you will work with is limited by the amount of protein in your sample. Compared to other detection methods, working with conjugates generally produces a weaker signal. On the other hand, as there is no secondary detection step, this method is faster compared to other methods. Furthermore, it is possible to use many antibodies from the same host this way, as the only thing that matters for detection is fluorophore choice. The next type of detection method is called indirect detection. In this case, the antibody that binds to your protein of interest is unlabeled, and a second antibody conjugated to fluorophores is required to detect the primary antibody. Because multiple secondary antibodies can bind to each primary antibody, there are more fluorophores to excite with this type of detection. This type of detection also allows for more flexibility when designing your multiplex panels, as long as you have antibodies from a suitable number of hosts and sufficient secondaries to detect them. For cases where even more fluorophores are necessary to detect your protein of interest, it is possible to use an amplifying method of detection. In this case, the secondary is conjugated to something like an oligo or horseradish peroxidase, and additional fluorophores are deposited through a reaction. This method is similar to the detection method used for chromogenic immunohistochemistry. So what fluorophores should you use in your experiment? The answer to this question is complicated, and we will discuss some of the nuance in later slides, but I wanted to give you some standard examples. Here, I'm showing our spectra of choice for a four-color image. I've used DAPI, which is a nuclear dye that's excited around 350 nanometers and has peak emission around the 450 range, as well as Alexafluor 488, Alexafluor 555, and Alexafluor 647. This is an image from our confocal microscope, and you can see from the curves on the right that this many dyes already has significant spectral overlap, which could make imaging challenging if any of the signals are too strong. Here's an example of a sevenplex image taken on a spectral imaging system. This system is equivalent to the spectra used in the Opal 7 color kit, and you can see how closely the spectra overlap. It would be incredibly difficult to image this without relying on a spectral imaging to unmix these signals. So what type of instruments can you use to acquire fluorescent images? 
The most frequently used instrument in the immunofluorescence group is our wide field epifluorescent microscope. This system uses a lamp or LED based light source. Fluorophore choice is limited by the filter sets installed in the microscope. This type of imaging will give you thick optical sections, which may increase background and give a less crisp image. We also have a confocal microscope in the immunofluorescence group, which we reserve mostly for publication quality images. This system uses a laser-based light source, although a lamp is also included for viewing samples through the eyepieces. Confocal may have traditional filter sets or tunable filters. Due to the nature of confocal microscopy, thin optical sections are acquired, which makes this a better instrument for acquiring Z-stacks. Confocals may have spectral and mixing capabilities as well. We also have a spectral imaging system in the lab. This microscope has similar capabilities to the epifluorescent setup. However, this system has a special camera for spectral unmixing. It's imperative that you include single color controls or spectral information for each channel that you're imaging so that the software is able to successfully unmix the channels. When working with tissue, keep an eye out for autofluorescence. Tissue may contain some proteins that fluoresce through most of the green and red spectrum. This is an example of a paraffin embedded tumor imaged on a spectral system. Because the spectral system unmixes the signals, it's able to isolate the autofluorescence into its own channel. Paraffin embedded samples in particular have a lot of autofluorescence as this can be induced by long fixation in formaldehyde. Meanwhile, each signal was unmixed into its own distinct channel, and you can clearly see the patterns for DAPI, PhosphoERC, and PhosphoS6. If you don't have a spectral system, confocal imaging also helps to reduce autofluorescence from tissue. When planning your experiment, it's important to be familiar with the objectives and filters available on your microscope because these can vary. While the GFP channel is similar across many systems, there are some differences in further wavelength channels that can have a dramatic effect on your experiment. Here we examine a filter set for Tritzi. Light between 530 and 560 nanometers is able to pass through the excitation filter. There's a dichroic bandpass filter in place to only allow light below 580 nanometers to reach your sample. Then light is reflected back through an excitation filter between 600 and 660 nanometers. This is a middle wavelength filter in the orange and red spectrum. Thinking that this is in the red spectrum, you might try to use Alexa Fluor in 594 on this piece of equipment, but that would be difficult even though you're working with what is considered to be a red filter and a red fluorophore. Here I'm showing two fluorophores that are both part of the red spectrum, but they're spectrally distinct. As I mentioned before, we capture images in grayscale and then pseudocolor to what we think best represents the fluorophore. In this case, both of these floors are red. Here is the excitation and emission curves for Alexa Fluor 594. Using this Tritzi filter cube significantly diminishes what wavelength of light can excite your fluorophore. Alexa Fluor 594 would be best excited in the 600 nanometer range. However, the filter cube that you're using only supplies light between 530 and 560 nanometers to your sample, significantly diminishing intensity of your signal. This is why being familiar with the limitations of your filters and fluorophores is important when designing an immunofluorescence experiment. One last thing to keep in mind when performing immunofluorescence is the characteristics of the antibodies that you're working with. As mentioned before, quantum yield will vary depending on what fluorophore you are using. As such, you may want to reserve a weaker fluorophore like Alexa Fluor 647 for something that you know is abundant. I'm showing the example of alpha smooth muscle actin here because this is an antibody that I know is incredibly bright every time I image it. On the other hand, if you're working with a less abundant protein, for instance, looking at ERK in the brain, this would be the time to use a brighter fluorophore, for instance, Alexa Fluor 488. Knowing how specific antibodies perform in your system may also help you to make decisions when to use direct and indirect detection. And you may even combine these methods in your multiplex panel, depending on antibody strength. I've covered a number of topics in a short period of time here, but I hope you found this review helpful. So in conclusion, remember, check your equipment settings and work with the equipment that you have. Understand the characteristics of the antibodies you're working with because this will help you to choose the best multiplex combination. Consult a spectral viewer as necessary to determine what fluorophores you can incorporate into your experiment 
and feel free to reach out to technical support if you need assistance. We are always happy to help. Thank you. Thanks so much, Virginia. And now we'll move on to the Q&A part of this session. We do have a number of questions already submitted, but keep them coming. Please feel free to submit your questions in the questions bar of your GoToWebinar control panel. And let's look at the first question for Virginia. Question number one, can I use flow approved for force for IF? So I understand why you would want to do that. It's really nice to have a complement complementary data set between your flow cytometry experiments and what things actually look like in tissue. But there's a couple of differences between how flow cytometry and how aminofluorescence work that you should keep in mind. So when you think about a flow cytometer, you have some lasers lined up that a single cell suspension is running through. And what this means for the fluorophores that you use in this experiment is that they don't have to be particularly bright and they don't have to be very photostable because they're only encountering light for a brief period of time. Now, when you're working with aminofluorescence, you're typically shining light onto tissue or cells. So it's a group of cells uh, and it has to happen for a period of time in order to capture your signal. And also you need to be able to discern between positive and negative cells in this group. So what that means is that your fluorophores need to be photostable and they need to be a little bit brighter than what you might encounter in flow cytometry. So can you use a flow cytometry antibody for your aminofluorescence experiment? Uh, Maybe. So I've used several FITSI antibodies successfully. Uh, it's going to be a matter of validating each antibody in aminofluorescence to make sure it's bright enough and that you can detect it. However, there are some dyes which are going to be very challenging to work with, like PE, which is not particularly photostable. Um, and so I would caution against trying it with that kind of a dye. Fantastic. Second question. Is autofluorescence less pronounced in some wavelengths as compared to others? Absolutely. So autofluorescence uh, is excited in a relatively broad spectrum in low nanometer wavelengths, so um, the mid 300s to 400s. And it's excited in another broad range from 400 to 600 nanometers. Uh, and so what that means is that when you use a more precise light source, you can reduce the amount of autofluorescence that you're exciting. And when you have a narrow filter set, you can reduce the amount of autofluorescence that you're detecting. Uh, so yes, it, it is excited earlier in the spectra. Thank you. Third question, what is the advantage of alexafluor dyes over others? So if you think about science history, uh, aminofluorescence started back in the 1940s. And over time, people characterized a number of fluorophores that they like to use, uh, but there were some challenges associated with these fluorophores. Alexafluors were invented in 1999, and they were invented purposefully to address some of these issues. So alexafluors are brighter than some of the earlier fluorophores. They're more photostable, and they're easier to conjugate. Now, with that being said, I've successfully used a number of the older fluorophores in my experiments, and those will work as well. So it's just a matter of what works best for the system that you're working with. Excellent. And can I combine different detection techniques in one slide run, for example, direct versus indirect? Absolutely. So if you think about combining conjugates with an indirect experiment, as long as the hosts of those antibodies are unique, uh, you can combine these easily. So you could choose to either put the conjugate on with the primary antibodies or to include the conjugate when you add your secondaries, either would work. Uh, if you want to use a conjugate of the same host as one of the primary antibodies that you're working with, that's also possible. Uh, we're working actively to put out a protocol for that right now, but basically it involves staining with primary and secondary before blocking and then adding the conjugate. Finally, if you want to add amplification to your experiment, that's also possible. Um, it would be challenging to do multiple rounds of amplification, but as long as you're just amplifying one of your channels, that's totally compatible with both indirect and direct aminofluorescence. Thank you. And let's see, what do we have? How does the intensity of the excitation light impact fluorophore stability? 
Right. So if you think back to how I was talking about how fluorophores emit a signal, uh, the light shines on and it excites the electrons. They move into a, a singlet excited state. And from there, they can either go back down to ground state and emit a signal, or they may move to a triplet excited state. So what this means, uh, oh, sorry, when they move to the triplet excited state, uh, they can be modified covalently, and so they'll no longer fluoresce. So this is photo bleaching. Um, and what this means is the more energy that you put into the system, the faster this reaction is happening, and the more of the fluorophores that are there are being quenched. So it's important when you're setting up your experiments to use the lowest laser power possible to detect your samples sufficiently, or to minimize the exposure time, the amount of light that you're shining on your sample. Uh, another way that you can work around photo bleaching is to include an anti-fade in your experiment that will definitely prolong the life of the fluorophores. Awesome. Let's see, how can I differentiate between autofluorescence and my fluorophore by eye? Right, so uh, as we discussed, autofluorescence um, has a broad excitation and a broad emission spectra. But because you are working with a specialized piece of equipment that's designed to specifically excite certain wavelengths, chances are that the autofluorescence you're seeing will be dimmer than the signal that you're detecting, as long as your signal is sufficiently strong. However, there's a trick that I like to use. Um, let's say I only need to look at two antibodies. I'll put one of my antibodies in the 488 channel, and I'll put the other one in the 647 channel, leaving the middle spectra open. What this allows me to do is I can image the 488 channel and then I can image the middle channel, the 555 or the 594. Um, and that channel should show me exactly what the autofluorescence looks like. So then when I overlay that channel with the 488, anything that's uniquely in the 488 channel, I believe is real signal. Whereas if I see overlap, I'm more suspicious that that is autofluorescence. Awesome, thank you. It looks like we have someone wondering, how can I look up the special properties of my fluorophore? Absolutely. I like to consult a spectral viewer when I'm looking up spectral properties of my fluorophores. Uh, if you're interested in a couple of um, spectral viewer recommendations, I like to use one called fpbase.org. Uh, the reason I like this spectral viewer, it's designed uh, more with aminofluorescence in mind. You can see both fluorescent protein properties as well as uh, the fluorophore properties. You can program in the settings of your microscope and apply those filter sets and laser lines to see how the fluorophores would emit. Um, however, there's also a number of spectral viewers which are more flow cytometry oriented. Um, and a good one for that kind of setup is a fluorofinder. They even have um, examples of panels for multiplex, like 16 plex cytometry experiments already there uh, for your consideration. So. Uh, Look at a spectral viewer, and um, there's a number of them out there. Cool. All right, next question. When I was researching dyes, I discovered that my fluorophore of choice has a terrible quantum yield, but it looks very bright. Can you help me understand why? Absolutely. So when I was talking about quantum yield, I sort of cherry picked a nice example, but I didn't tell you the rest of the story. So we'll do that now. Uh, when I was talking about fluorophore brightness, there are a number of components that go into that. So how many fluorophores are present, uh, the quantum yield, and the extinction coefficient. So when you look at the extinction coefficient for alexafluor 488 and compare it to the extinction coefficient for alexafluor 647, uh, 647 is actually much brighter uh, with the extinction coefficient than uh, alexafluor 488 is. So combined together, the quantum yield and the extinction coefficient, these dyes become much more equivalent. Uh, the final part of your experiment that's really important to consider is how many fluorophores are present. So as long as you have enough protein to detect and you have sufficient antibody and secondary binding to that, it doesn't really matter if the fluorophore is a, a weaker fluorophore because you'll still be able to see plenty of signal. Excellent. Next question. How to optimize these conditions effectively between immunofluorescence and freshly fixed versus paraffin embedded cells tissues? Right. So um, we hear about 
uh, formal and fixed paraffin embedded sample a lot in the immunofluorescence group. It's a, a popular uh, area to work in. And uh, actually, I've done both frozen fixed and paraffin embedded uh, immunofluorescence in the past. So I totally understand. Uh, but with that being said, they are very different sample types. You have to think about the processing steps involved with these two. So with a fixed frozen sample, um, you typically have a brief fixation, and then you'll follow whatever protocol steps are recommended for use with the antibody. So that might be tritonex permeabilization, or it might be methanol permeabilization. It might even be methanol fixation. Uh, if you think about formalin fixed paraffin embedded sample, on the other hand, it always has to be fixed in uh, formalin or formaldehyde, and that fixation is a longer period of time. So then that sample is exposed to heat and to organic solvents, um, and it typically requires antigen retrieval in order to be able to detect your proteins at the end of it. And this can really change the antigenic landscape of what that antibody is able to detect. And so it's really important to optimize your experiments in both the fixed frozen and the paraffin embedded sample independently. Maybe even compare the patterns that you see with those back to a GFP reporter so that you can be really confident that you have um, gotten the setup right. They, they are quite separate um, experiments. Uh, one last thing, if you look at the CST website um, and you look at the recommendations, if you're working with uh, the paraffin embedded sample, look and see if it's recommended for immunohistochemistry because that'll give you a good idea that it's compatible with the paraffin embedded tissue. Awesome. Next question. We have someone wondering um, how to determine the intensity of GFP reporter protein. Sometimes it's difficult to see the positive or real GFP in tissue. Absolutely. So uh, with GFP, you are limited by the amount of fluorescent protein that your system makes. If you're looking at uh, a protein with less abundance, it may be more difficult to detect it. With that being said, there's a couple of tricks that you can use to sort of set yourself up for success. So first off, when you're collecting your sample, assuming you're going to fix it, make sure that you fix it before you section it. Um, if you think about applying a liquid to the, um, the fluorescent proteins in the tissue, if it's already exposed, some of that fluorescent protein is going to drift away before it's fixed. So uh, yeah, fix it before you cut. Also, um, like I mentioned before, uh, the fluorescent proteins can be quenched by xylene and ethanol. So uh, try to avoid those kinds of processing steps if at all possible. And uh, if it's absolutely necessary to do paraffin embedding or um, those kinds of processing steps, you may want to use an antibody to detect the fluorescent protein. That'll give you a boost in signals so you'll be able to see it again. Thank you. Next question. How bright are your Aluxafluor secondary antibodies compared to Thermo Fisher's new Aluxafluor Plus antibodies? Right, so Alexafluor plus antibodies are reported to be brighter than Alexafluors. However, we've compared them side by side in our group, and we didn't really see a significant difference in brightness. There could be a number of reasons for that. Um, maybe once you have a sufficient amount of signal, you're not going to see a difference in brightness. Um, when you think about an immunofluorescence experiment, there's a number of components that come into it. Uh, how much protein do you have present? How many fluorophores are you able to label it with to detect it? And you want to find the right balance where you have enough signal that you can detect it in the channel you're working with without too much or too little signal. Um, so a, a number of different options are available to complete your experiment, and you should use what works best in your system. With that being said, we do validate all of our antibodies in the immunofluorescence group using our Alexa secondaries, and they work really well in that setup. So we know that that's something that you could try. Fantastic. Next question. How can controls be best to validate antibodies when working with very limited human tissue specimens? Right. I love controls, so I'm glad somebody asked that. Um, so if you think about uh, a rare or precious sample type, uh, you have a couple of options. You could try to include um, another uh, similar control 
uh, or I'm sorry, another similar sample uh, to see how things perform there before you get started working with your sample type. Uh, but I think a, an easier and more approachable strategy for most people is to work with cultured cells. So if you make a pellet of cultured cells in OCT or paraffin, you can include that on the same slide that your precious sample is on. Um, and that'll give you confidence, assuming that you include a known positive and a known negative for what you're working with, that uh, the antibody is specific specific and also that everything is performing optimally in your system. Fantastic. Next question, do we have any recommendations for obtaining a clean signal when performing live fluorescent imaging of cells over longer periods of time, for example, 24 hours? So I haven't really done a lot of live imaging, um, but I do know that it's important to uh, put the lowest intensity of light that you can still detect signal with. Um, I also know that uh, you might consider not shining your light on full time, um, picking time points over a course of a period of time to just really minimize how much you're um, working with that specimen. Uh, I unfortunately don't have a really good answer there. I'm sorry. That's all right. All right. Looks like this is our last question that we have time for. Do you have any suggestions to avoid signal diffusion of fluorescence for IF experiments on cultured cells with nitrogel? Hmm, diffusion. Uh, we we did work with matrigel uh, in the past. Um, I don't think we really encountered diffusion. That's a good question though. I'd like to do some more research on it. So I'll look into that and send you an email later. Perfect. Well, it looks like that is all, folks. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, we hope that this was very helpful for you. And if we didn't get to your question, we will be following up with you by email. So thank you very much for your questions. Um, don't be shy. Please let us know anytime we can help you. We'd love to hear from you and uh, help advance your research. Thanks and stay well.